let's start with the appointed Old Testament lesson from Jeremiah 27 to 13. Let's uh, read it together if we can. You deceived me, Lord, and I was deceived. You overpowered me and prevailed. I am ridiculed all day long. Everyone mocks me. Whenever I speak, I cry out, proclaiming violence and destruction. So the word of the Lord has brought me insults and reproach all day long. If I say, I will not mention his word or speak any more in his name. His word is in my heart like a fire, a fire shut up in my bones. I am weary of holding it in. Indeed, I cannot. I hear many whispering, terror on every side. Denounce him. Let's denounce him. All my friends are waiting for me to slip, saying, Perhaps he will be deceived. Then we will prevail over him and take our revenge on him. But the Lord is with me like a mighty warrior. So my persecutors will stumble and not prevail. They will fail and be thoroughly disgraced. Their dishonor will never be forgotten. Lord Almighty, you who examine the righteous and probe the heart and mind, let me see your vengeance on them. For to you I have committed my cause. Sing to the Lord. Give praise to the Lord. He rescues the life of the needy from the hands of the wicked. Okay, have you ever been frustrated when someone who has authority over you orders you to do something that you prefer not to do? Of course. <laughs> of course. Yeah, I think about chores when you were a kid. I don't want to go pull weeds in the garden. <laughs> so it starts pretty young, right? Yeah. Yeah, parents, kind of authorities, you know. Um, as you're growing up, might be a teacher who tells you you got to do something you don't want to do. It might be a coach who says you need to do this if you're going to improve and you don't really want to do it. Run suicides. Run suicides. Yeah. There's a reason they call them that. There is. <laughs> um, bosses at work who, um, he, uh, it always kills me when people act like they should enjoy everything that they do at work. Because there are things that have to be done that aren't, that, fun. That aren't fun. And the same thing is true when you get older and you're thinking about even your own tasks, uh, taking care of homes and, and, and so on. There are just things you don't really enjoy doing, but they've got to be done. And uh, Jeremiah, Jeremiah uh, the reason for that question is obviously Jeremiah is in this kind of situation. Now to understand, um, you know, he's kind of ticked at God at the beginning, isn't he? Oh, Lord, you deceive me. That's a great way to talk to God. <laughs> you ever said that in your prayer life? Um, so why is he feeling that way? Well, um, if we look back to uh, uh, the lead up, we understand a little bit more. So um, uh, I'll tell you what I'll read because of the names here. <laughs> When the priest Pashur, son of Immer, the chief officer in the temple of the Lord, heard Jeremiah prophesying these things, he had Jeremiah the prophet beaten and put in the stocks at the upper gate of Benjamin at the Lord's temple. The next day, when Pashur released him from the stocks, Jeremiah said to him, The Lord's name for you is not Pashur, but Megar Masabib. For this is what the Lord says. I will make you a terror to yourself and to all your friends. With your own eyes you will see them fall by the sword of their enemies. I will hand all Judah over to the king of Babylon, who will carry them away to Babylon or put them to the sword. I will hand over to their enemies all the wealth of the city, all its products, all its valuables, and all the treasures of the kings of Judah. They will take it away as plunder and carry it off to Babylon. And you, Peshur, and all who live in your house will go into exile to Babylon. There you will die and be buried, you and all your friends to whom you've prophesied lies. And if you uh, look at the footnote, you see that Magor Masabib means terror on every side. Um, God often gives people names that reflect something. So that's the context. Um, what happened here? 
Well, if you know Jeremiah, it says when Pashur heard everything that Jeremiah had said, what did Jeremiah said? Well, you got to go before that, obviously. And he just keeps telling them that they're going to go into captivity because of their idolatry. disobedience and idolatry. And, um, and some of the other prophets, when it references what Pashur is saying, some of the other prophets were saying, no, God would never do that to us. God would never do that to us. See, we're his chosen people. We, we're, we're, no matter how bad we are, he's never going to punish us that way. You know? Um, and uh, when I think about that, I think sometimes about being a parent and sometimes, you know, uh, kids think <laughs> that you won't lower the boom. But you love me. Well, yeah, I do. That's why this is called tough love. You know, it's hard, but it's what you need right now, not maybe what you want. And maybe it doesn't feel like love to you. But you know, all of us have received love from parents, and we, uh, we have given love, and sometimes to others, whether it's our children, brothers, or sisters. That's been tough love. Say, I'm sorry, but this is the way it's going to be for your good. You think about people who are getting older and maybe starting to have dementia, and, and there comes a point where you're going to say, you can't drive anymore. Mm -hmm. you know? and, and sometimes they don't recognize that they can't drive anymore, and, and that's a hard conversation. But if you care for them and other people who are on the road, you got to say, mm -hmm. it's at, when you're at that point. Hard. So, so this is the context uh, behind this. You think Jeremiah's had a good day. They beat him up and they put him in stocks. Overnight? That, that's kind of the description of a bad day. That's kind of the <laughs> description of a bad day. Yeah. Um, yeah, and why was he beaten up and put in stocks? For saying the truth. He did the right thing. And, um, and so in his frustration, and that's where our, our text begins then for this Sunday, it, it, he, he begins with this, you deceived me, Lord, and I was deceived. You overpowered me and prevailed. I'm ridiculed all day long. Everyone mocks me. Whenever I speak, I cry out, proclaiming violence and destruction. Now, what is Jeremiah doing here? Something we all do at various times. Venting. He's venting, mm -hmm. right? What's a proper response when somebody's venting? Let him finish and then <laughs> listen. Listen. Yeah. And understand that sometimes what they're saying on the surface isn't really what they mean. It's a way of, because sometimes, you know, when you're highly emotional, words come out of your mouth that, um, you know, that, that you haven't carefully thought about. They're unfortunate. They're unfortunate. <laughs> They're words that you maybe have to walk back, as they say about uh, politicians. Well, they had to walk back that statement, you know. Because in the heat of the moment, you said something that was maybe inappropriate. What I always find interesting when it comes to, to, to this is that, that God doesn't, you know, smack them upside the head. Right? And um, it, it's also, I think, a great comfort to us because you know um, have you ever gotten angry with God? It's the last question here. You know? Is it okay to be angry with God? And the answer is yes. As long as you tell him about it. Um, I know I constantly get this because in the, the conflict resolution chapter that I use in premarital um, there's a question that says, uh, uh, what about anger? Is it ever helpful? And uh, they almost always say, no, it's never helpful. You know? And I tell them they're wrong. <laughs> How is anger helpful? Because it's good to get it out. Well, well it also, I think, uh, I use this analogy. I say uh, anger is like your emotional um, alarm clock. 
Um, it tells you that whatever you're angry about is something that is very important to your heart. It reveals, you know, what things really matter to you. And, and when you understand that, it, it, and that's why in the Bible, in, in Ephesians, Paul can say, be angry but don't sin. It's not the anger that's the sin. It's what you do with it. In fact, the anger might be necessary in order to get you to deal with something that you should have maybe dealt with a long time ago. But it takes a, it takes the point where, you, where you're really, really upset, really, really angry that you say, like Popeye does, that's all I can stand, and I can't stand no more. You know? um, it can be helpful if you're, if you're using it that way, first of all, to, as a self-revelation. Um, when I get angry about something, this means it's something that's important to me, which means if I don't deal with it, I'm going to get bitter. And if I cover it over and act like nothing's wrong, it's like a word picture, you get a sliver and you don't get it out. Don't even know it's there. I had a gal in my first congregation, went through a windshield. Okay. Um, and I went to the hospital and they picked out all the um, glass, but they obviously missed one because eventually she had to go back and have them take it out. She had a um, growth in her cheek that was about the size of a small orange. Ew. Yeah, didn't go back right away, should have, yeah. you know? And what was it? Well, there was still something in there and the body was still fighting it with infection, and so it was filled with pus and all kinds of fun stuff. So, um, and that's what happens when you bury anger about stuff that really matters to you. Is it's going to come out, but when it comes out, it's usually not pretty. It can be pretty ugly. It festers. It festers, and it destroys your life because then you're just simmering about it all the time. Anytime you think of it. You know, and and that's why again Paul says, "Don't let the sun go down in your anger." In other words, deal with it. And uh, learning how to deal with it in a helpful and hopeful way is is very very important. So anger, it also is sometimes you know it isn't until I get angry enough that I actually want to do something about it. You know, I let it go and say, "Oh, it's not that big a deal. It's not that big a deal." And then I find it's it's a big deal. Mm -hmm. You know, um, and. And so anger can be helpful to help us realize um, uh, how serious something is to our own hearts, and it can be helpful in getting us to deal with something that uh, is very near and precious to our own hearts. Um, so, and, and it's interesting in the scriptures that you have, whether it's here in Jeremiah or in the Psalms, you have um, God's people getting mad at him sometimes. Even Moses gets mad, you know. If you remember in the wilderness, it's like, why in the world, God, did you give me these people? Why are you just kill me? <laughs> Elijah gets frustrated and depressed, right? Right after the experience on Mount Carmel, he runs for his life because Jezebel put a price on his head. And, and finally he says, God, you know, why was I born, you know? And uh, actually, the part of the text here is uh, reflective of that same kind of attitude. It's just not in our reading for Sunday. So the next question is, uh, what range of emotions is Jeremiah experiences in verses 11 to 18? So we're at the last couple of verses of our text, but then see what he says toward the end of the chapter. Somebody want to read uh, verses 13 to 18 for us, the part we didn't read. Sing to the Lord, give praise to the Lord. He rescues the life of the needy from the hands of the wicked. Cursed be the day I was born. May the day my mother bore me not be blessed. Cursed be the man who brought my father the news, who made him very glad, saying, A child is born to you, a son. May that man be like the towns the Lord overthrew without pity. May he hear wailing in the morning at battle cry at noon. For he did not kill me in the womb with my mother as my grave. Her woman large forever, 
Why did I ever come out of the womb to see trouble and sorrow to the end of my days in shame? Well, that's a delightful <laughs> lament, huh? And you notice they didn't keep that in the in Old the Testament reading. reading, you know. And that's why it's always important to read the context. But the point is, is what are the range of emotions he's experiencing? Well, praise, he's, praise the Lord and curse my parents. <laughs> yeah, he, he, he has, he's on an emotional roller coaster. So he's kind of down, oh Lord, you deceived me to begin with. Um, all my friends are after me, that kind of thing. But in verse 11, the Lord is with me like a mighty warrior. So my persecutors will stumble and not prevail. And then he says, sing to the Lord. And then he comes up with this, oh, I wish I was never born. Um, and I, I say that's bipolar. <laughs> <laughs> it, it certainly is the ups and downs. One of my favorite, um, uh, let's see if I can find it here. Uh, I want you to go to the Psalms. I think it's 43 and 44. Yeah. 43 and 44? Yeah, Psalm 40. Oh no, it's 42 and 43. That was close. Um, when when people are struggling sometimes with some challenging thoughts in their own lives, I always I'd like to refer them to this song just to say that you know these things happen and they happen in a Christian's life. They happen in um, in, in in the life of God's people in the Old Testament, and, and you can see it in, in these two psalms, which they debate whether they were at one time one psalm because they have the same refrain. In Okay, so he, he starts as a deer pants for streams of water, so my soul pants for you, my soul thirsts for God for the living. Where can I go and meet God? My tears have been my food day and night, while men say to me all day long, where is your God? These things I remember as I pour out my soul. How I used to go with the multitude leading the procession to the house of God with shouts of joy and thanksgiving among the festive throng. So he starts in a place where he's really down. Um, and then he remembers, uh, you know, kind of some spiritual high in the past. And then, this is the refrain that repeats in these two psalms. Why are you downcast, O my soul? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Savior, my God. Do you ever talk to yourself? <laughs> you see, that's what he's doing here. Okay, come on, guy, buck it up. Buck up. You, can, you, you know that God loves you. Uh, in spite of how you're feeling right now, you know that God loves you. He, he goes on with uh, the downside again. My soul is downcast within me, therefore I remember you from the land of the Jordan, the heights of Hermon from the mountain Zar. Deep calls the deep in the roar of your waterfalls, all your waves and breakers have swept over me. By day the Lord directs his love, and night his song is with me in prayer to the God of my life. I say to my God, my rock, why have you forgotten me? Why must I go about mourning and oppressed by the enemy? My bones suffer mortal agony as my foes taunt me, saying to me all day long, where is your God? And then comes the refrain. Why are you downcast, O my soul? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Savior and my God. Um, and so you have this, this um, struggle with Kind of a depression and the depressive thoughts but then always remembering how God's mercy and grace have been there in the past for him and uh, he does the same thing in Psalm 43 the refrain is only in one place at the end of the psalm vindicate me O God and plead my cause against an ungodly nation rescue me from deceitful and wicked men you are God my stronghold why have you rejected me why must I go about mourning oppressed by the enemy. Send forth your light and your truth. Let them guide me. Let them bring me to your holy mountain, to the place where you dwell. Then I will go to the altar of God, to God my joy and my delight. I'll praise you with the harp, O God, my God. Why are you downcast, O my soul? Why are you so disturbed with me? Put your hope in God. For I will yet praise him, my Savior, my God. 
So the range of emotions, and I think that's one of the things that is really comforting about the Psalms is that you and I can find almost any emotion reflected in, in the saints who have gone before us. And people who trusted God, even in the middle of some challenging situations, and that's where Jeremiah is. He's not enjoying life right now, you could say. Um, and, and, and then just thinking about his language, he talks about being weary of holding it in. Were you ever weary of holding something in? Could be something that's uh, bad news that you know, but it's not yours to share. And you just want to say something, you want to talk about it, you want to, but it's not your story to share. And, and that can be kind of weary. Could be something good like a surprise party and you can't tell the person that. Or it could be in this day and age, I find that uh, that uh, uh, pregnancies are that way. People don't want to. The parents don't always want to say that they're pregnant. Sometimes they tell their parents that they're pregnant, but don't tell anybody till the you know first trimester's over. And and the grandparents are really weary <laughs> of holding it in, of not telling and celebrating and all that kind of stuff. But usually there's some reason for why they have some hesitance. And, um, so that kind of weariness of holding something in, I think, is something we can identify with. Uh, and, and, and then, you know, Jeremiah is suffering for doing the right thing. What have you done the right thing and suffered for it? I've, I've mentioned it before, so I think went to pick up. strong medication for seizures mm -hmm. and early morning was not the best, the best for her but Jean wanted to be at the Avid Box <laughs> so I said okay and it was raining that day and I uh, so I selected a pair of flats that were old because I thought I don't care what happens to these so I was standing outside in the rain with a rain, an umbrella waiting for them to come to the door. We got them here, um, we got them in, and then we realized we didn't have the large print bulletins because the brother who still comes here, she has passed away, uh, it was partially blind. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. to get a, a large print bulletin, I, I went back and so I came back. Pretty soon, I see John John, who I think one of the ushers come up, and and he's got the the uh, the little not the vacuum but the little you know thing that, that picks up like a dust cleaner, right? Mm -hmm. Carpet sweeper, yeah. sweeper. And uh, you know, and he stops at my and he said, Sharon, and I said, well, Why are you looking at me, John? And you know, then <laughs> later on, I looked down. Here, the heel had come off those things, and there was a packing, oh. <laughs> you know, white crack. <laughs> <laughs> you were shedding shoes? <laughs> and I, you know, so then, and it was, of course, it was communion Sunday, and I could not wear those to go up, so I thought, okay. If I don't look at my feet, nobody else will either. <laughs> <laughs> so we're, we're trotting up for communion, and um, I, in, in leaving, I just I just picked up the shoes and walked out <laughs> in my nylon hose. <laughs> so, and I just always said, you know, and, and this is a case of no good deed goes on. Exactly. <laughs> Oh, that's funny. It's funny now. 
<laughs> right, exactly. The time it was horrifying. Yep. Absolutely. Well, already as little kids, you know, kind of thing where you pick that for tattling when it's something really serious and a teacher needed to be told. Mm -hmm. But you're doing the right thing. see that uh, <clears throat> and, and, and it, it's hard and it's it's hurtful and you feel bad both because other people are feeling bad about you and and, and kind of takes the joy out of doing the right thing mm -hmm. and I always wonder Jeremiah's uh, called the weeping prophet you see why. It wasn't a, a fun task. Um, and and uh, I don't know, the thought just popped into my mind. And uh, it's one of the hardest things as a pastor, I'll tell you, is to say what the congregation needs to hear rather than what they want to hear. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know? And to say it in a way that they'll hear it as a sign of your love and compassion and care rather than as a sign of judgment and anger. Um, you know, it's, and, and you think that's his job. He's a prophet. He's supposed to tell God's people what God says, but they weren't particularly enamored of the message he was bringing. All right, anything else about that test that struck you or you want to explore a little bit? Well, then let's go on to the Romans uh, passage, which uh, we're covering quite a bit. So we're going to kind of just walk through um, some stuff we can't walk through on Sunday morning because uh, of time, unless we had about a three-hour service <laughs> to cover this section, but it's all about assurance, confidence in God's salvation. So I'm going to get you started. I'll step out and I'll come right back. Let's uh, read Romans 5 together. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into his grace when you shall stand. And we boast in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings, because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance character, and character hope. And hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit, who has been given to us. You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person, someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since we have now justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath from him? For if while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through this life? Not only is this so, but we also boast in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received the reconciliation. What well, then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave out for us all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who then is the one who condemns? No one. Christ Jesus who died, more than that, who was raised to life, 
is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sorrow? No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation, shall be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Okay, this is the longest section of Romans, and we're going to kind of, uh, if you've got your Bibles open, walk through it. So what has Paul done so far? He's introduced the good news that Jesus died for sinners, and he says in that first section, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, the good news of God, for it's the power of salvation to everyone who believes, both Jew and Gentile. Then, in the next section, which we covered a couple weeks ago, was God's, God, God's good news was for sinners, and there he made the case that we all got the disease. That was the diagnostic uh, language of the Apostle Paul, saying that we're all sinners, we all share in sin, um, whether we're under the law, that is, whether we knew the Ten Commandments or not. It doesn't matter, because... Uh, uh, he says certain things are evident that God is holy and that he is powerful. And so there, everybody's without an, an, an excuse. And then uh, last week was the emphasis on the fact that God's grace or God's good news is a message of grace, that it's an undeserved gift. And that it comes to everyone who believes, not because of what they've done, but because of what God has done for us. And now he's talking about the consequences of that, and he's giving uh, a number of different examples of what it means, uh, the, the implications that Jesus died for our sins, and now we're right with God. What does that mean? And what does it bring to us? And, and so that's where the first question com com comes from, is with whom do you feel completely at peace in your relationship? That's tough, isn't it? Right? Because even in the best relationships that you and I have, things can happen, you know, to disturb the peace between us. And, and, um, and, it, it, and, and I don't know about you, but in every relationship, I don't care how good it is, there's always a little bit of uncertainty. You know, if I say this, how are they going to respond? You know, kind of like Jeremiah, even if I, if it's the news I need to share, but it's bad news, how are they going to respond? And, and will they still love me? Will they still like me? Will, will we still be good? You know, and you, you'll hear that sometimes after people are, are, you know, sharing something that's a little bit honest and they'll say, are, are, are we still good? Which really kind of means, are we still at peace? Are we still in a relationship? And, and this idea of peace is tied to, in biblical terms, shalom is the Hebrew word. And, and a place of shalom is a place of, um, of confident uh, perfection kind of thing. When you're at peace with the world, when you're at peace with your neighbor, when you're at peace with a brother, sister, mother, father, husband, and wife, when you're at peace with your kids, you know, and the reality is that in our world, I don't know about you, but uh, I think that peace is, for, it's hard to get, and it's really hard to maintain. It's really hard to maintain. Um, and, and, and what Paul is addressing is not our relationship with each other or with others in our, our uh, circle of relationships, but he's addressing our relationship with God. What do we know? What is the good news that comes out of what Jesus has done for us? And, 
And, and he says that the kind of the um, seminal um, statement, the thesis statement, is in chapter 5, verse 1. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. And, and as you think about all, all that he says there, we have been justified, declared righteous, not guilty, through faith, not through things that we've done, but just trusting what he's done for us. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, he's the one who was the peacemaker, the prince of peace who came into this world to establish that peace. Through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. That Jesus is pictured um, as the it's the door into the presence of God. Um, and just by way of thinking a little bit about that, um, what kept the, the people and every other priest except for the high priest from God? It was the, in the temple. It was a curtain. Um, so what happened the day Jesus died? Torn to it says from top to bottom. And the point is, is that when Jesus died, he opened that access into the Father. And before that, you needed a priest to do stuff for you. And after that, guess what? We're all priests. And we can come to the presence of God ourselves. It gives us access into the presence of, of God. And, and all of that is, set, is said in, in, in this one, uh, just this first verse which is the premise of what's going to follow in chapters 6, 7, and 8 as well. So how much of God's peace of hope need to begin with a feeling and how much begins with head knowledge and clear understanding of factual information? This is the question of, uh, uh, of head and heart. What comes first? Do they come together? What do you think? What's the factual information that gives you peace? Your keeps orbiting around the sun and it's not diving into it. <laughs> well, in terms of your relationship with God, it's the facts about Jesus' life. That he was conceived, born, lived, died, and rose for us. That he lived an innocent life in our place and died an innocent death in our place. He took on our sin and gave us his righteousness. Those are those are facts. The question is, is when does that become real to you in terms of your heart? When do you feel at peace? Just because it's true doesn't mean you feel it. You know? And 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 so this question gets at this, how do you how do you get to that point where you feel it? Recognizing your the, honestly your situation, and then realizing what God has done for you, and that that's what. I mean, before that, you might not even feel feel the peace at all. Um, although I I do think that we get a lot of peace just. By living and trying to uh, stay close to the word, um, so there's like a little bubble around us, just being in St. John's. Right. A little bubble, a little. <laughs> but um, but the real the real feeling of peace. I don't think I don't know if you really feel that until you realize that you don't deserve it at all. Right? <laughs> And then it's like, oh, now I realize the size of the, the love of God for you. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. When you understand what your need is, then you can understand right. how incredible it is that God filled that need with the gift of this. You know, um, and and sometimes those could be you know spiritual experiences where something really hits home to you. 
Um, when you talk to kids who go to Christian camps, it's one of the places where they very often have that kind of experience. In hmm? Epiphany. In Epiphany. Uh, with my kids, I know when they were at Lutheran High, they did something called the Senior Retreat, and I can tell you every one of them came back changed. And you constantly heard from kids, and I heard it from other kids besides my kids, why don't they do that sooner? <laughs> and um, I think part of the answer is you wouldn't be ready for it necessarily sooner. Some people have experienced those kind of epiphanies on, on uh, mission trips. Um, we um, were building some houses in Mexico at, uh, at Emmanuel, and um, a young lady from Northwest, who was a friend of one of our kids, uh, Northwest Church uh, uh, Covenant, uh, went along with us. And, and her dad went along, but he was not um, I, I will just say he had the head knowledge but not the heart knowledge and it was really interesting because on the way back they always stopped at a certain place and had a devotion and, and he just said you know this has been life transforming for me um, because God touched me in the middle of this I mean I knew all the facts but now I really feel the peace and, and joy and all that. And so sometimes it can be those kind of things. For me, very often it happens in the Lord's Supper. It's just, it's always been very, very precious. Um, I've often thought that for those of us who were raised to be Christians, you know, you, when you're a child, you have an innocent faith, and it's easy, you know, because, you know, I'm Jesus' little lamb, that kind of thing. It's easy. And as you're working your way, you know, as a, a young adult and all that kind of stuff, it's just habit. And it's when you, it's it's getting to a point in your life where you have like another epiphany where it becomes more real. Because you, you're living your life through the facts, not necessarily through the right. feeling. And I always thought, you know, I, my parents had a pastor up at, in Oshkosh who was raised Baptist, was a military chaplain, he was a chaplain in prison, all that kind of stuff, and he became, his, his, he was raised by his aunt, and I don't even remember the entire story, but he became a Lutheran pastor, because right. he had this epiphany, and he was super passionate. It was so inspiring to listen to him, because as an adult, his life had been changed, and, and he was so passionate about it, and I was like, I don't know that I've ever had that and I, and I look at it like a certain kind of jealousy of people who found Jesus later in life because they know when that point was for them. For me, it's just been my whole life. Yeah. You know, so it's it's a very different relationship, I think. Definitely people who come uh, later on in life feel it a little bit differently than, mm -hmm. than those of us who grew up that way. At the same time, I remember... Um, um, Leroy Biesenthal, who at one time was head of uh, Synod's Evangelism program, when we had a head of, <laughs> when we had an evangelism program for somebody to be the head of, uh, <laughs> he wrote Dialogue Evangelism too, and there were a couple guys, Paul Faust was, uh, when I first came out of the ministry, that was their job, and I remember being at a conference, I think it was for the Dialogue Evangelism too, and in Dialogue Evangelism, which was a, uh, Pastor Kennedy from down in Presbyterian Pastor down in Florida. It's this kind of program. That's the two questions, you know. Um, if you were to die tonight, where would you end up? And if God would ask you, why should I let you in? Yeah. And, and he said one of the things, and he went through that training, but one of the things that was very much Baptist and was very much, you know, you should be able to identify the time when you became a Christian. And, and he said to Archie Hart, who was the guy who was leading the seminar, who worked with uh, Dr. Kennedy, he said, that's not my story. He said, I, you know, I'm the son of a Lutheran pastor. I grew up in a Christian home. I've always known Jesus loved me. And, and he said, I feel bad because all these people are getting up with these wonderful, you know, <laughs> dramatic, 
I was in the ditch doing something, you know, I should have been doing it, you know, and God got a hold of me kind of thing. And, and, and what Archie told him is he, because he said, I don't know what to write for my testimony that they were trying to come up with. He said, well, write that. Write that. Because that is, it's your testimony. And he said, why would you be jealous of somebody who had to go through such garbage before they came to understand love and, and know the life that Jesus has to offer? Why would you want right. to well, do that? And then you always think, and what if they died the day before that revelation? Right. It happens. <laughs> so, so he said, just be thankful and share your story, because that's what a testimony is. It's not about sharing somebody else's story, and it's, it, it's not a bragging contest to see who has the, the best story. It's just your own personal witness about this is how... And I always found that real helpful because then for my own, that's the way I'd say it, you know. I never knew a time when I didn't know Jesus as my Savior. I have no conscious memory. It just doesn't exist. I always say, I am Jesus' little lamb, mm -hmm. you know. Um, and, and I realized because I was in that, did it, does it mean I never screwed up? No. Does it mean there haven't been some ups and downs in my spiritual life? No. But what it does mean is I was always secure in God's love. I was always secure in God's love. And I always knew him as my Savior. And um, and that's really where Paul is here. He's, he's saying, you know, once you understand the gospel story, the good news, your security becomes very, very real. Now, I'm just going to check my time here because we've got a lot to cover. Um, well, the first thing he talks about is what a difference it makes in suffering, and that's uh, verses 3 and 4. So how does Paul describe a positive purpose for suffering? Where's the joy? He says we rejoice in our sufferings. Because it produces perseverance. Perseverance produces character and character. So there's a purpose in in suffering, he says. And again, he says we rejoice. It doesn't mean we're happy. Remember, joy is a relationship word, not a circumstance word. It's not that everything's going good in our lives. It's that we're secure in our relationship with God, and we understand that God uses suffering as a way to, to do his work in us and through us. Um, specifically talking about perseverance and character and hope. And hope isn't a pie in the sky hope here. Hope is, um, is uh, um, an absolute certainty of what's coming. Um, and all this comes by the Spirit who's been poured in our heart. I just note again, because we're in just past Trinity season, that in this first paragraph you've got all three persons of the Trinity referred to. Um, now, in the next section, chapter 5, uh, 12 to 20, he contrasts Adam and Jesus. And, and this is one of the significant places where Paul is trying to describe the security that we have in Christ. Because what we got from Adam was anything but security. So, um, somebody want to read verses... Uh, 12 to 14 for us. Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man, and death through sin, and in this way death came to all men, because all sinned. For before the law was given, sin was in the world, but sin is not taken into account when there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from the time of Adam to the time of Moses, even over those who did not sin by breaking a command as did Adam, who was a pattern of the world to come. So um, what he's saying here is Adam had a strict command, right? Don't eat from the tree. And he disobeyed it. Now, there aren't a lot of other commands in the Old Testament about what to do and not to do. Um, you know, eventually uh, Abraham was told to circumcise himself and the others in his family and that kind of thing. But uh, the reality is that the law, in terms of the Ten Commandments that have been given, and yet everybody, as he made the case in the second section, is accountable to the law even 
if they don't know what the law is because it's written in our hearts this thing called conscience okay but so what, what do we get from Adam we get sin and the disease of sinful souls is introduced into this world so that sinners give birth to sinners how do we know we have the disease because we're all dying you know, um, I just wrote that to somebody when we were talking about, he was for Gordy Nichols, you know, that uh, a quote I always love is that uh, when we go, when we die and leave this world, one of the ways that we can think about it is we're leaving the land of the dying to enter the land of the living. Because here, everybody's dying. It's just a matter of time. But there, everybody's going to live. And live forever. So this is the land of dying, and, and to think I'm, I'm, I'm leaving the land of the living because I'm dying is just all wrong. I'm leaving the land of the dying, and I'm going to the land of the living. Um, and the... the um, and so the contrast is between Adam and Jesus. What did Adam bring? Well, there he brought sin into the world. He brought death into the world. He brought judgment into the world, as he goes on a little bit later. Um, and, uh, and what did Jesus bring? Well, Jesus brought the gift of God's grace in verse 15. And, um, and instead of condemnation, he brought justification. And he brought the gift of righteousness, as he says, the gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. So righteousness now becomes the, the ruler of our hearts and lives. And, and then in chapter 6, I'm just going to run through these a little bit because we're going to be doing this on Sundays. It's just too much. Um, you've got the words death and die in a question used many times. What's the point and how is this tied to baptism? We are in the land of the dying and we're all going to die. So what has God done for us and what gives us, remember this is all about security and salvation. Baptism um, connects us to the death and the resurrection of Christ. It's one of the places that another teaching about baptism comes up. When you were baptized and I was baptized, we were baptized in the name of the triune God, in the name of Christ, so that his death becomes our death. And his life becomes our life. So, what assurance does that give? Well, uh, did Jesus rise from the dead? The answer is yes. yes. Is he living forever? The answer is yes. So if you have his, the power, if you think about it in terms of the sin as being the disease, now we've been inoculated. We've got the inoculation. And it came through the work of, of Jesus. And now death can't hurt us anymore. And that's why so often in the New Testament, this is in this particular text, but Paul and Jesus both talk, their favorite word for death is not death, but it's sleep. Because sleep. when you lay down at night to go to sleep, you expect you're going to wake, wake up in the morning. And, um, and, and so you've got this transferal to baptism. And baptism then becomes the assurance um, that God has uh, adopted you into his family, has connected you with Jesus, that all the things that Jesus did are now yours. So he says in verse 8 of chapter 6, Now if we died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. For we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, he cannot die again. Death no longer has mastery over him. The death he died, he died to sin once for all, but the life he lives, he lives to God. In the same way, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God. 
And then he uses the analogy of slavery to sin and slavery to God. That's uh, in the second half of chapter 6. And, and it's in verse 17. Somebody want to read 17 and 18 for us? <laughs> Thanks be to God that though you used to be, a, be slaves to sin, you wholeheartedly obeyed the form of teaching to which you were entrusted. You have been set free from sin and have become free to righteousness. And then he concludes that chapter with uh, 20, 21, uh, 22, and 23. Somebody want to read those from 21 to the end of the chapter. When you were slaves to sin, you were free from the control of righteousness. What benefit did you gain at that time from the things that you are now ashamed of? Those things result in death. But now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves to God, the benefit you reap leads to holiness and the result is eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Yeah, and... Um so it's in this context where he says, you know, you've been set free from that slavery, but now you haven't been set free from completely. What's the picture here? Well, it's this concept of how do you get into slavery? You owe a debt. How do you get out of slavery? You either have to pay the debt or somebody else to pay it for you. Jesus has paid it for you, and you're no longer indebted to your former master, but now you're indebted to your new master, who is Christ. Bob Dylan in his uh, Christian phase, he had three Christians, uh, three or four Christian albums, uh, wrote a song called You Gotta Serve Somebody. It may be the Lord, maybe the devil, uh, but you gotta serve somebody is the refrain. And it's this concept that you're gonna be a slave to one or a slave to a, another. And so often in the New Testament, when Paul writes or some of the other apostles write, um, when he introduces himself, he'll say, Paul, sometimes it's translated servant, when it should be translated slave. Paul, a slave of God. And, and it's not, but it's a different kind of slavery. It's the kind of slavery that God engendered and, uh, in the Garden of Eden. Adam and Eve were servants of God. They were to do God's will. Would it have been better if they had done God's will? It would have brought blessing to their lives, and that's the difference. It's a slavery that doesn't destroy us, but actually blesses us. And, and again, stressing at the end of that section that sin has wages. You pay for sin, and it's death. But God is a good giver, and he gives eternal life in Christ Jesus. Then he uses a, an analogy with marriage. And, and here it, it's basically this. Uh, he says, do you not know, brothers, for I'm speaking to men who know the law, that the law has authority over a man only as long as he lives. And then he uses an example. <clears throat> By law, a married woman is bound to her husband as long as he's alive, but if her husband dies, she's released from the law of marriage. In other words, the commitment that she made is no longer in... Right. It's no longer in force. Until death do we part. <laughs> and when death comes... You're no longer obligated to keep that that vow. Now there are some who will say, "Well, I'll never marry again." You know, maybe. Um, yeah, there are some who say, "I met my one and only. That's it. I'm done." Um, I kid Jerry and I say, "Well, when you've had the best." You know. <laughs> And then I usually get hit. <laughs> and, uh, um, and so this is the analogy that he's using. It, it, is that if her husband dies, she's released from the law, he says in, in verse 3. And even though she marries another man, she's not an adulteress. Because, you see, in their culture under the Old Testament law, if you divorced for uh, uh, an unbiblical reason and you got remarried, you were considered an adulteress under the law. Um, and so he said, but that doesn't apply if your husband died. 
So this again is once more, again saying we're not bound to the restrictions of the law. The way we get to heaven is not by obeying the law. The way we get to heaven is uh, through the gift that God has given us in Christ Jesus. Now, um, to add to that fact, he says even if you try to obey the law, guess what? You're not going to do it. And that's the end of chapter 7, which I think is a great comfort. I don't know about you, but it's a great comfort for me. What battle is still raging in Paul's life? Um, if we especially pick out... Um, da, 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 da. Uh, ver somebody want to read verses uh, 15 to 20 for us. Of chapter 7, I think. Sorry. Yeah, I do not understand what I do, for what I want to do, I do not do, but what I hate, I do. Wow. <laughs> and if I do what I do not want to do, I agree that the law is good. As it is, it is no longer I myself who do it, but it is sin living in me. For I know that good itself does not dwell in me, that is, in my sinful nature, for I have the desire to do what is good and cannot carry it out. For I do not do the good I want to do, but the evil I do not want to do. This I keep on doing. Now if I do what I do not want to do, it is no longer I who do it, but it is the sin living in me that does it. Okay, no. Wow, that's a lot of I do some things. <laughs> <laughs> right, I do some things. It gets hard to read. <laughs> what's, he, what's, he, what's he getting at? He's getting at this. Is my head is subservient to Christ. I want to do what God's will is. But sometimes my desires take me in a different direction. And um, so I'm trying to think of a word, a word picture. A word picture would be something like, Having a disease that only shows up once in a while, you know. Um, I may have epilepsy, but the only time you see it is if I have a seizure, right? Um, I may have diabetes, but the only time you see it is when I have one of those episodes where my blood sugar is out of whack. Mm -hmm. um, the disease is always there. The expression of it is not, and no matter how much I try to make sure that uh, by taking medication and all that, you see, my mind is trying to do the right thing, but my body has still got the disease and it's still going to express itself once in a while. And he says the same thing is true when it comes to our spiritual lives. When we've come under the sway of Jesus Christ and he is our Lord and, and, and we know what he says and we want to do it, I don't want to run anybody down with my mouth. I, I, I don't want to be dishonest with anybody, but then I find myself sometimes doing that. Um, and, and sometimes I, 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 in the middle of that, I can look back and say, what the heck were you thinking, you know? Why did you do that? Why did you react that way, you know? And, and what Paul is simply saying is, it's because you're a sinner. <laughs> and sinful stuff is going to come out. Um, and whether it's big sins or little sins, they're there. And, and part of the whole process of confession and absolution on a Sunday morning, uh, something God invites us to do uh, not only publicly in that way, but with each other, is, is, is to recognize when those things come up. And, and to realize that, yeah, I still need Jesus. I still need the... And at the end of this chapter, then he's got this wonderful, uh, I think, wonderful, uh, wonderfully comforting uh, celebration of God's grace. When he says in verse 24, What a wretched man I am, who will rescue me from this body of death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So that I myself in my mind am a slave to God's law, but in a sinful nature a slave to the law of sin. In other words, I'm going to carry this with me till the day that I, I die. But right after going through that struggle, chapter 8, and this gets back to the part we're going to read on Sunday morning, the very first sentence is, Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. 
because through Christ Jesus, the law of the spirit of life set me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law was powerless to do, in that it was weakened by the sinful nature, because in other words, we are breaking the law. God did by sending his own son in the likeness of a sinful man to be a sin offering. And so he condemned sin in sinful man in order that the righteous requirements of the law might be fully met in us who do not live according to the sinful nature, but according to the spirit. So, so he says, it's a wonderful, who can, who can um, lay a charge against us? Well, no one can, because God's already said, you and I, because of Jesus, have the innocence, the righteousness, and the perfection of the joy of, of our salvation. And how do we know that this is really true? Well, I, one of the assurances is um, uh, in verses uh, uh, 13 and 14, or actually it's 13 through 15. For if you live according to the sinful nature, you'll die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you'll live, because those who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you didn't receive a spirit that makes you a slave again to fear, but you received the spirit of sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself <laughs> testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. So this gets back to the triangles I had on Sunday, that our identity is rooted in the love of God not in our obedience. Our obedience flows from our identity. Uh, we don't get our identity from being perfect, and that's what he's saying here. Are you the father, son, or daughter? If you're the son or father, son, and daughter, then you've been made that, not because of what you've done, but because of what he's done for you, and it's grace, and it's mercy, and because of that, he can end that one, this chapter with that wonderful crescendo what shall we say in response to this? Is God is for us who can be against us. He who didn't spare his own son but gave him up for himself, how will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? That's an argument from the from the greater to the lesser. You know, and so the word picture I like to use for that is buying a car, average new cars around thirty five to forty thousand dollars to talking with Karen and her husband wants a truck. And they're looking at one that's, you know, fifty thousand, one that's seventy-five thousand. <laughs> they're not cheap, right? But if you spend that kind of money on a vehicle, are you going to forget the fifty-dollar oil change? Are you going to say that's too much? And that's the argument that Paul's making here. God has already given you His very, very, very best. Why would you think He wouldn't do the other things that need to be done in order for your life to? And, and it's that confidence, and you see where he takes you is he takes you to the foot of the cross, and, and it's, it's something that we have. Um, when you want to know how God feels about you, you always go to the foot of the cross. You always go to what he's done for you. And it's in that uh, confidence that you can say, there's nothing that can separate me from the love of God that's in Christ Jesus. His heart will never change for you. You know, I, and I always tell people, you know, the one thing it doesn't say here, it doesn't say you can't walk away from him. There's nothing in this world that get, can get in the way of the relationship about you and him. But it, you can say, as people said to Jesus sometimes, no, I don't want to have any part of you. And, and, uh, um, and so that, that's uh, all meant to be for us the assurance that, that God's love is always there, will always be there, and hopefully motivates us to live guided by his spirit. But when we sin, we don't have to say, well, God's not going to accept me anymore because it's not based on what we do. It's based on what he did. Let's close there with a word of prayer. Lord God, Heavenly Father, we thank and praise you for speaking a word of assurance, absolute assurance in your our hearts about how great and, and wonderful and incredible your love is for us. And we just help that you uh, ask that you help that uh, truth move from our heads to our hearts so that we can live in that confidence each and, and every day. 
Bless us to that end in for your name's sake. Amen. But forgot to bring the balance. I'm all part of it. I got a little.